Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gerhard Kasper, and I serve as the president of the American Academy in Berlin. Uh, and I want to tell you that the life of the president of the American Academy is really incredibly strenuous and dangerous. I mean, you may have to make lots of you have to make lots of decisions, and 50% of the time your decisions are wrong. So when Roxani talked earlier this week, I knew she would be very elegantly dressed, and I decided in the morning when the question, big question was, will you put on a tie or not? I better put on a tie to live up to Roxani. And this morning, I thought, that, uh, thought about the Thai question, and uh, Robin mm -hmm. never, never wears a tie. So I concluded that I would be well off if I left my tie behind. What does he do? Wear a tie tonight. <laughs> but <coughs> it is a really very difficult life. Now, some of you may think, my main task is to say a few words about the person who will introduce Robin. Um, some of you may think, after we had this in the last 10 days, two distinguished visitors, each of them was a Stanford professor, uh, Frank Fukuyama and Alvin Roth, uh, uh, that the only reason Max was chosen to introduce Robin was that he has a Stanford PhD. You might think that, but you're wrong. You would be deaf terribly wrong, because it had nothing to do with anything. I learned that he had a Stanford PhD only this morning when I looked at your CV. Uh, but I'm just, so it is not the Stanford PhD that has recommended Max to me, but rather the fact that his first book which was called, published by Harvard, and called In the Shadow of Sectarianism, Law, Shiism, and the Making of Modern Lebanon, is to a large extent based on the French mandate rule and the decisions of the Islamic courts during the period. And of course, as some of you know, I'm by background a law professor, and I always delight when social scientists understand the incredible potential of court decisions as part of cultural history. Max is a historian of culture uh, and po politics, of course, of the Middle East. How could it not be? And uh, is now a pro he's a Californian. That also endears him to me. Uh, but uh, he is now a professor at Princeton. Uh, one more word about uh, his uh, PhD at Stanford. Uh, it came really after he had, had acquired a BA at Berkeley, across the bay, and believe it or not, his BA was a double BA, on the one hand in molecular and cell biology, and on the other hand in history. And with that kind of combination, mm -hmm. he knew there was only one place where he could do his PhD, and that was Stanford. And uh, we were very happy to have you, uh, Max. Mm -hmm. I, I said we had a wonderfully interesting discussion about Syria uh, at the table tonight. Uh, but uh, I s turned to Max and said, as I uh, read his biography, I saw that he does the most self-denying engages in the most self-denying activity uh, writers and literary, literary figures and academics can engage in. He translates, and he has translated Syrian novels into, uh, and I, by the way, I will read the titles to you so that you can go and buy them. Uh, that would be very important. Uh, so he has uh, translated Nihaj uh, series The Silence and the Roar, uh, Sama Yazbek, A Woman in the Crossfire, Diaries of the Syrian Revolution, and uh, Hasuna mm -hmm. 
Mospahi a Tunisian tale. I, without having read any of them, I'm sorry, I did not have the time. I warmly recommend them to you, simply because here a great scholar engages in this self-denying act of translation. Max. Well, thank you so much, Gerhard, for the invitation to come and the unexpected uh, introduction, which I fear may end up being longer than the one I'm about to give for Robin. Um, I must say, in uh, coming down to Wannsee from Kreuzberg, I was reminded of the kind of border crossing that I did going from Berkeley to Stanford. <laughs> I was thinking on the train also of a, a cliche about how folks who are fellows at the academy don't quite know how good they have it, but after spending dinner with you all, I realized that I think you do. <laughs> so Robin Cresswell is, I think it's fair to say, um, oh, and one other thing, I also am uh, quite exercised by the Thai question. I think it's one of the most pressing issues of our day. I'd be happy to talk about it more at any point. <laughs> Robin Cresswell is a rare combination of scholar, but also public intellectual. He writes regularly for mainstream US and international publications, including, just to name a few, Harper's, The New York Review of Books, The New Yorker, he also happens to be the poetry editor for the Paris Review. He also happens to be a selfless, if that's the term we're going to be using tonight, and I certainly think it's an appropriate one, translator of both Arabic and French literature, as well as philosophy. Robin has translated a novel and a collection of prison writings by the Egyptian writer Sanal Ibrahim. That Smell and Notes from Prison. He's also translated work by the Moroccan cultural critic and philosopher, Abdel Fattah Kilito, The Clash of Images, and I understand he's working on another work by Kilito, which will be published soon, entitled The Tongue of Adam, inshallah. And uh, this would be enough, but incredibly, this is not even Robin's day job. Robin's day job, it turns out, after completing his PhD at NYU and then teaching for several years at Brown University, is an assistant professor of comparative literature at Yale, where he teaches courses on modern Arabic literature, comparative literature, poetry, and so on. The work that he did for his PhD, which I believe animates some of what we're going to be hearing in his talk tonight, is important work on the history of Arabic poetic modernism. Those of you who have not read his dissertation should not run out and buy the translations that Gerhard mentioned that I had anything to do with, but should find a PDF of Robin's dissertation in order to read about how he makes what I think is a very compelling argument about Arabic modernism as a mechanism of transmission, this very nice turn of phrase, that Arabic modernism, as exemplified by the poets and intellectuals whom I believe we're going to hear a bit about tonight from 1960s Beirut, are neither slavish adherents to some norms of tradition within the history of Arabic poetry, nor are they entirely derivative of the field of global modernisms. Figures like Adonis, Yusuf al-Khal, Unsi al-Hajj, Mahmoud Darwish, luminaries in the firmament of modern Arabic poetry are central in Robin's work. And to his credit, the work does something very important. It both adequately historicizes this moment in the history of modern Arabic poetry, but it also does something else, which I think often historians of modern Arabic literature and literary critics and critics of poetry don't do which is to recognize the ways in which the Arabic literary field is deeply enmeshed in global circuits of writing and reading and reciting. And so I look forward to Robin's talk tonight. Robin, as uh, you see here, is the John P. Berkelund Fellow for the spring at the American Academy in Berlin. And I look forward to his talk on Arabic poetry and the project of modernity. Please join me in welcoming him. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> 
Max, for those very nice words. I could say uh, equally flattering things about Max, and I hope someday uh, I'll be able to. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to the Academy, to Gerhardt, for having me here as a fellow. Um, it's been a really lovely first two months, and uh, Pamela and I and our children are looking forward to the next two, uh, two and a half. And thank you um, in particular to the, everybody in the kitchen, um, Reinald, Stefan, Noel, Matthias, and Julio, who uh, made us that yummy meal, and to JT for, um, for arranging everything this evening. Um, <clears throat> and finally, to my fellow fellows uh, for a really, a really convivial first two months, and, and especially the breakfast crew. <laughs> for um, because I, it's not it's not always easy to spend your first waking hours with a children children of one and three years old, um, even for us. So so thank you. Uh, this evening I'd like to recount for you an episode <clears throat> in the history of the nationalist imagination and more specifically the Pan Arabist imagination. In late 1947, the Iraqi poetess Nazik al Malaika wrote Cholera, a poem addressed to the epidemic then raging through Egypt, which he published in a Lebanese literary magazine. al Malaika wrote her poem in one of the classical Arabic meters, of which there are exactly 16, but she used a variable number of feet per line. In most classical poems, each line has the same number of feet and is divided into hemi-stitches by a cesura. So classical poems look more or less like this. And this is a 16th century manuscript of some pre-Islamic poetry. And you can see each line is the same length. And there is a gap or sejura in the middle of it. And the, the, the red writing beneath the lines, the black lines, are um, commentary. This, it looks a little bit like Anglo-Saxon verse, in fact. Uh, al Malaika's poem, by contrast, looks like this, much more familiar. Um, the lines are of different lengths and there is no sejura. al malaika's prosody, which she called a sha'ad al-hur, or free poetry, broke with 14 centuries of metrical orthodoxy. She wasn't the first modern Arab poet to experiment with meter, but she was arguably the most successful, and the reasons for that success are part of my topic. Initially controversial, free poetry became a kind of orthodoxy in its own right during the 1950s and 60s, and cholera was canonized as the first example of this form. Now, I shall have relatively little to say about the poem or prosody. Uh, my interest tonight is not so much al Malaika's uh, text as it is her account of its inspiration, that is to say, how she came to write it in the particular way that she did. And this story, I want to argue, is a parable of the pan-Arabist imagination. In search for sanction for her technical novelties, al Malaika tells a story of generational crisis, of new political solidarities, and of artistic innovation. And it's a story that tries to reconcile aesthetic modernity with political nationalism, the demand to make it new with the demand to make it authentic. Now before moving on to the details of this story, I want to say something about the circumstances that led to my own interest in it and which I hope will lend it some additional interest for all of you. A striking aspect of the political upheavals that began five years ago in the Middle East and which have mostly ended in failure or worse was their family resemblance particularly in the early stages, what we might call the springtime of the Arab Spring. The shared, languages of the, the shared language of these uprisings and occasionally their tactics seem to me to make the question of pan-Arabism suddenly relevant once again. Although none of the re revolt's leaders pressed to dissolve national boundaries as Nasserists did in the 1950s and 60s, the common culture of the uprisings, their joint fund of slogans and strategies, was unmistakable, and this resurgence caused many people off guard. To take an especially aggravated example, here's the opening of Fuad Ajami's essay in Foreign Affairs magazine a year after the uprisings began, quote, throughout 2011, a rhythmic chant echoed across the Arab lands, the people want to topple the regime. It skipped borders with ease, carried in newspapers and magazines, on Twitter and Facebook, on the airwaves of Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya, Arab nationalism had been written off, but here in full bloom was what certainly looked like a pan-Arab awakening, end quote. 
Now the passive construction here, had been written off, is very odd, because Ajami himself, who's a very prominent commentator on these subjects, wrote off Arab nationalism not without a certain relish, 20 years earlier and in the same magazine. In the end of Pan-Arabism, an essay published in the wake of Sadat's Camp David diplomacy, which really put a nail in the coffin of Nasserist politics, Ajami wrote, quote, the Arabs who had once seemed whole, both to themselves and to others, suddenly look as diverse as they had been all along. The differences smoothed over by ideology and a universalistic designation can in no way be ignored or suppressed. And Ajami thought that the decline of Pan-Arabism was a healthy sign of normalization. The charismatic leader of Nasser, charismatic leadership of Nasser, like that of Nehru in India and Nkrumah in Ghana, was, quote, bound to come to an end for the sort of nationalist fervor they embodied triumphs for a moment but cannot live forever. How then shall we explain Pan-Arabism seeming return from the dead? Has normalization now taken hold once again? What echoes of that mid-century moment can we hear now? What communities did it imagine and what made them obsolete? The second point I want to make by way of prologue has to do with the relation of artistic innovation to technical innovation. Now, as Ajami notes, the, the pan-Arab nature of the 2011 revolts was facilitated by new technologies of social media, and the centrality of these media may have been exaggerated, but there's little doubt that YouTube and Facebook and Twitter helped to establish a culture for the revolts, which was a vertiginous expansion of an unofficial anti-regime youth culture that always existed, but which now suddenly expanded to the point where it could challenge the state's jealously guarded powers of disseminating information and ideas. The revolts did have a culture of their own, running the gamut from graffiti, posters, and stencils to rap music and documentary films. And these artistic practices were closely related to the new forms of political community that social media made possible. And sometimes these new political communities were grounded in much older ones. As one Syrian protester put it, and I'm quoting from a recently published book, about Syria called Burning Country, quote, everyone in opposition to the regime became brothers, Kurds and Arabs, Muslims and Christians. We discovered the geography of Syria for the first time. So let me give you just a very short um, example of one artistic community that grew up in the shadow of these revolts and whose practice uh, is importantly inflected by new technologies. Abu Nadara, uh, a collective that I've spoken to a number of the fellows about, is a group of Syrian filmmakers who began making documentary shorts in 2010. For the past five years, they've posted a new film online every week, resulting in an archive of about 400 films now, all viewable for free on Vimeo. And the filmmakers are anonymous. They've revealed next to nothing about their methods of collaboration. Many of Abu Nadar's films are monologues by unnamed Syrians of different classes, regions, sex. And I think that women make the most compelling subjects. The protests lifted a lid on political speech for all Syrians, but it's clear that for women, for many women, the experience of going out into the street to demonstrate, often against the express wishes of older relatives, was profoundly transformative. And whatever the ultimate fate of the war in Syria, it's hard to imagine that this change will be completely reversed. Several of the women in these films talk about the revolution as a discovery of one's voice, a political coming to consciousness. And because the story that I have to tell this evening has to do with a similar kind of coming to consciousness and a similar kind of feminism and generational revolt, I thought I'd, I'd show this film, which lasts about three minutes. And the speaker is a young woman from Aleppo, Syria's second largest city. And her story traces a kind of arc from fear to enthusiasm, to a kind of disillusionment. I was in the house when someone saw a car written on it in Syria, and I put a picture of it in the sky and said, Baba, you are going to be a part of it. I don't know what he was doing with us. There was a lot of joy in my life because of the past 80s. Every family is going to be a part of it. بما في عائلتي حتى لو ما كانوا سبورتيف للاخوان ابدا بس بس راحوا ناس كثير بالعجقه فكثير كان في جو محتقم مع ذلك لما صارت الثوره وبلشت العالم تموت اهل حلب اخذوا حاله بوز 
ما ما حدا كان بده يتدخل ما حدا كان بده يعمل شيء كل كلمه بيقولوها الكبار قدامك ايه انت ما كنتي هون انت ما شفتي شو صار بالثمانينات إيه بدهم يتوحشوا بدهم يقتلوكم كلياتكم طبعا نحن كناس صغار ما استوعبنا هذا الموضوع اطلاقا انه شو هاد الناس عم تموت يعني لازم تعملوا حركه لازم تعملوا شيء حاولت ساعد بي تامين ادويه اكل الناس بحماس وقت بلشت تنقص عندها الاغراض الشتاء صرنا نجيب لهم حرامات هل هذا الموضوع كان لا يقل خطوره ابدا عن المظاهرات وحتى يمكن كان جريمه اكبر بالنسبه للنظام بس بس كنت لسه عم اقول يا الله المظاهره كثير بتخوف بركي اخذوني بركي بركي اخذوني وضربوني مثلا بركي سالوني مين رفقاتك وقلت لهم مين هن ما كان عندي القوه لحتى انزل مظاهره لحد يوم عملوا مظاهره علنيه بجامع الكبير قالوا هاي المظاهرة في رصاص هاي المظاهرة رح ينضرب في رصاص قلت كتير كويس معناتها بنموت منيحة يا يعني كتير موضوع بسيط يا ب... يا بتموتي يا ما خلاص بتروح البيت نزلت على هاي المظاهرة ب... صدقا مالي من ذكرى التاريخ بظن بشهر ثلاثة 2012 إذا مالي غلطانة يعني واحد ممكن يطلع على تاريخها نزلنا في المظاهرة يلا شو حلو شو هاد ناس عم صيح هيك و ألف شخص جوات الجامع الكبير وعم نعيط يعني وما حدا حكى معنا شيء كثير كويس ماني خبر مظاهره هالقد حلوه لوقت ما انفتح الباب وبلش الرش يعني بلش رصاص هيك يدخل على الجامع والناس بلشت ترقد وصارت الحاله كثير سيئه وتسمعي صوت رصاص 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 قلت لي لسه ما فيها مزح عن جد فيها موت المهم هي كانت اول مظاهره بنزلها في حياتي بعدين صار الموضوع انه اخذت الموضوع فول تايم جوب <تصفيق> لازم نعمل مظاهرات ولازم نعمل إغاثة ولازم نعرف ما بعرف شو لوقت ما في نهار كان في تشييع لشهيد بالإذاعة طلع طبعا كانوا دايما يقولوا الجيش الحر الله يحميه أنا كانت الهتافة دايما ما شارك فيها ما لأني ضد جيش حر بس ما كنت بحب العنف ما بعرف يمكن لأني بنت ما ماني متعودة على هذا الكونسيبت ما ما ما, ما بعرف ليش ما كنت بحب أهتف بهذا نهار تابع هي التشييع تبع الإذاعة قالوا قائدنا للأبد سيدنا محمد طلعت هيك لا شو سيدنا محمد سيدنا محمد ما ما قائدكم أنتو ما له علاقة فيكم هون حسيت صار صار لا لا صار لازم نفهم هدول العالم شو بعدين بعد شهرين تانيات بالجامعة بتطلع مظاهرة أوف طلع لا إله إلا الله علم أسود لك يي أنتو طلاب جامعة ليه هون بلشت أقول لا لا by her own account, El Malaika wrote the poem <clears throat> in Baghdad, published it in Beirut in December 1947. Later that same month in Cairo, El Malaika's countryman Badr Shakar Sayyab published Halkana Hubban, Was It Love? Another poem in classical meter that used a variable number of feet per line. And beginning in the mid 1950s, the form attracted the attention of younger poets, and a debate arose as to who its inventor really was. And this is the setting for a series of texts by Al Malaika that I will read as an origin story <clears throat> about the new verse form, which is also a story about the role of poetry during a moment of political crisis. The shortest and earlier version of this narrative appears in the opening paragraph of Qadaya Sha'ar al-Mu'asar, Issues in Contemporary Poetry, a study of metrics that Al-Malaika published in 1962 and which is one of the signal works of modern Arabic literary criticism. And here are the opening lines. The beginning of the free, free poetry movement was the year 1947 in Iraq. From Iraq, indeed from Baghdad itself, the movement marched out, spreading until it covered the entire Arab nation. Because of the great enthusiasm of its supporters, the movement nearly swept away all other modes of our Arabic poetry. And the first published poem was Free Poetry Was My Own, entitled Cholera. And here she appends a footnote. I composed the poem on October 27th, 1947, and sent it to Beirut. It was published by Al Uruba magazine in the issue of December 1, 1947, and I wrote a commentary on it for the same issue. I wrote the poem as a means of giving form to my feelings for Sister Egypt, while she was in the grip of a cholera epidemic. And in the poem, I tried to articulate the fall of horse hooves as they pulled the carts of corpses, victims of the epidemic, through the Egyptian countryside. The necessity of articulation or expression, darurat al-ta'abir, led me to the discovery of free verse. 
In his introduction to the same volume, al Malaka's husband, Abdul Hadi Mahbuba, a well-known literary critic, adds several details to this account, relying on a notebook in which the poet recorded the events of that October morning. According to these notes, al Malaika finished her poem, written in a burst of inspiration, and entered the family room where her parents and siblings were gathered. Hers was a cultured, middle-class family. The mother herself was a noted poet. al Malaika's announcement of her invention and a reading of the poem was greeted with skepticism. Quote, fans of European poetry will certainly understand it, says her sister, Ehsan. The father is less subtle. The new meter gave me no pleasure. Lem yutribni, he says. Who will read the poem? Iraqis, like me, used the majesty of al-Mutanebi and the eloquence of al-Buhtari. These are two great classical poets. You won't be able to stray so far from Arab tastes. The mother remarks more equitably that the poem resembles the Sha'ar al-Manthur, prosified poetry, a form pioneered by Levantine poets like Khalil Gibran, though she says, quote, it doesn't lack a certain strange meter. Wasn gharib. It's only the brother Nizar who approves of the poem, though not because he claims to understand it. Quote, a work that is greeted with such great hostility must, in my opinion, be something great. <laughs> In the responses of al Malaika's family, we have, in effect, a whole range of critical opinion on the Sha'ad al hura that it was pretentiously foreign, the sister's opinion, that its break with tradition was too radical to find a local audience, which is the father's, and that its so-called innovations recalled previous experiments in Arabic, al Malaika's mother. Now, before looking more closely at this anecdote, I want to note a later retelling of the same story included in an autobiographical text al Malaika composed around 1970 in which she used as the introduction to her standard edition of complete poems. And this account is a fuller and more stylized version than the one presented by Mahbuba in the, from the notebooks. al Malaika describes her family listening to daily reports of the cholera epidemic on the radio in which the number of victims keeps rising higher and higher which seems like a peculiarly modern experience. When the number reaches 300, al Malak is overwhelmed by a poetic excitement or poetic influence, infi'al shari. In the grip of this strong emotion, she composes a poem and conventional hemi-stitches, but soon feels that the verse did, quote, did not articulate what was in my soul, that my emotions were still on fire. This experience of inspiration followed by disappointment is repeated several days later. She hears that the number of cholera deaths has reached 600 and quickly composes another poem in a different, though equally conventional, meter. And her second failure leaves her in a state of frustrated catharsis, wondering how she will give expression to the, her sense of the catastrophe unfolding in Egypt. And she writes, quote, on Friday, October 27th, 1947, I woke from sleep and lounged about in bed listening to the radio, as it announced that the number of deaths had reached 1,000. An extreme sadness overwhelmed me, and a great excitement. I jumped from the bed, took my notebook and pen, and left the house, full of the noise and bustle of Friday. Next to us, a home was being built. The builders had reached the second floor, but the site was empty since it was not a work day, and I sat on a low wall and began to compose my now well-known poem, Cholera. I had heard on the radio that the bodies of the dead were carried through the Egyptian countryside, piled up in horse-drawn carts. And while I wrote, I sensed the sound of horses' hooves. Second al-layl, usqi ala waqi sada al-anat, fi umqi dhulmatin tahta samti ala al-amwat. The night is still. I listen to the beat of lamentations for the dead in the dark beneath the silence. And these are the first lines of the poem. In this version of the story, it's al Malaika's sister, Ahsan, who's the first to read the poem, and she is immediately enthusiastic and rushes to show the mother. What's this strange meter, the older poet winces. My daughter, the hemi-stitches don't balance. The music is weak. But it is the father, again, who delivers the severest blow. What is this death, death, death? Al-maut, 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 he complains, quoting the poem's refrain, an echo, it may be, of the horse's hooves. He then cites a brutally apropos and classically balanced verse of Al-Mutanabbi, epitome of the Iraqi and the Arabic canon. لِكُلِّ جَدِيدٍ لَذَّةٌ غَيْرَ أَنَّنِي وَجَدُّ جَدِيدَ الْمَوْتِ غَيْرَ لَذِيدٍ All novelty has its pleasure, but I have found the novelty of death to be unpleasant. <laughs> Al-Malaika's rewriting of this episode, 
Her additions and amplifications testify to its importance and it provides the narrative with an anecdotal polish, tra transforming the initial version into what classical critics would call a khabar, a story with layers of significance and an implicit lesson. El Malaika's insistence on dates, the day of the week, the day of composition, the day of publication, is partly explained by her determination to prove that she wrote free poetry first. But it also draws our attention to the historical origins of the verse form. For the emergence of a Shad al hur is not, in her telling, a case of romantic creation ex nihilo. Instead, it emerges from a swirl of circumstances, literary, political, familial, and emotional. And this interest in the dialectic between historical occasion and poetic inspiration is a constant in her writings. Ash'ar walid ahdath al hayat Poetry is the offspring of life's events, as she writes elsewhere. So what do I mean by calling al malaikas anecdote a parable of the pan-Arabist imagination? In her account, the new prosody emerges from an experience of empathy with a people of a foreign Arab nation whose political situation was strikingly similar to her own. In 1947, Egypt and Iraq were both occupied by the British and governed by compliant, unpopular monarchs, King Farouk in the case of Egypt and the regent Abdul Ilah in the case of Iraq. Al Malaika's sense of kinship with sister Egypt and the victims of cholera is an expression of political solidarity. At the time, Local writers attributed the outbreak of the disease which occurred near the Suez Canal zone to the movement of imperial armies. In September 1947, cholera began to spread across the Punjab region of India, then in the throes of partition. British troops on their way home stopped in Egypt's Tel al-Kabir military base. The idea of British responsibility for the epidemic was first advanced by the journalist Muhammad Hassan al Haikal, <coughs> later a confidant of Nasser, editor-in-chief of Al Ahram and spokesperson for the ideals of Arabism, and he just died uh, last month, in fact. In an editorial entitled Political Cholera, published in uh, Akhbar al yawm on October 25th, 1947, so just two days before Al Malaika composed her poem, Heichel argued that just as the cholera microbe entered via British planes, so too did the political microbe enter via Britain. And so the connotations of cholera go well beyond the realm of public health, and the disease serves as a signifier for all that is amiss with colonialism. In Al-Malaika's poem, the speaker is represented as an elegiac witness to the epidemic. In the opening section, she listens to the cries of the sick and the dying in the still of the Egyptian night. Everywhere a voice cries out, this is what death has torn apart. Death, death, death. In the second stanza, dawn rises over funeral processions and the poet tallies the bodies, 10, 20, too many to count. The final two stanzas are the most desperate. Hatta haffar al-qabri thawa lam yabqa nasir Al-jami'u mata mu'adhinuhu Al-mayyitu man sayuabbinuhu Lam yabqa siwa nawhin was a fear. Even the grave digger lies in his grave. There's no help. The mosque's mu'azzin is gone, so who will eulogize the dead? There's nothing left but wails and lamentation. In the absence of the grave digger and the mu'azzin is the poet, of course, who will eulogize the dead. And cholera is a collective elegy or political poem of mourning. And we might recall the politicization of mourning rituals was an important element in all of the Arab Spring uprisings. The speaker of Al Malaika's poem figures her empathy with the victims through acts of audition. I listened, Uschi, I lent an ear, Asikh, Asikh, and I heard, Esma, are the key actions of the poem. This mode of witnessing points to the distance separating the poet from her fellow Arabs, whose sufferings are only present through the medium of the radio, which Lenin once called the universal ear. It also suggests the poet's susceptibility to sound, to imagined lamentations, as well as the clip-clopping of horses. And it is not by chance that the name for the meter of the poem, al-khabab, means the trotting. Read in this way, the dates of al-Malaika's anecdote acquire an additional stratum of meaning. The fall of 1947 witnessed the opening phase in the civil war in Mandate Palestine, another Arab country still occupied at the time by Britain. In fact, contemporaries feared the cholera outbreak would preclude Egypt's participation in the planned offensive 
That October, the government announced the army was too busy cordoning off infected areas to take part. But even with Egyptian participation, of course, the result of the war was a catastrophe. For pan-Arabist intellectuals, the loss of Palestine indicated the perils of fragmentation, the need for Arab states to coordinate their political and military strategies. And for such intellectuals, the humiliation of Arab armies was an alarm bell. And al Malaika's evocation of her own awakening on that October morning links the occasion of her poem to this broader coming to consciousness, its rejection of narrow nationalism in favor of wider solidarities. And one of the themes of this discourse of awakening, uh, whose resonance today is striking, is a deep skepticism towards the older generation of political leaders. And this is an attitude that one finds, for example, in Gamal Abdel Nasser's Philosophy of Revolution, where he blames the defeat of the Arab armies on the Egyptian elite. In Malatika's anecdote, the crisis is portrayed as a conflict between generations. It's her siblings who recognize the poem's worth, while her parents refuse to acknowledge it. Isten kara ebi al-qasida, she writes. My father refused to recognize the poem. In the first version of this conflict, in the, in the excerpts selected by Mahbuba, there are still shades of gray. And Malatika's sister is sarcastic, her mother is skeptical, but curious, her father is uncomprehending, the brother is supportive, but also uncomprehending. <clears throat> and in the second version, the lines are very clear. The sister greets the poem with great enthusiasm, while both the father and the mother react violently against it, and the brother has strangely disappeared. <clears throat> the narrative also suggests, by way of the father's insistence on al-Mutanebbi as the summit of poetic achievement, that his own canon is too narrowly national and perhaps patriarchal. Certainly the anecdote is, in addition to everything else, an allegory about female liberation. And al malaika's rewrite of the part played by her sister, transformed from antagonist into ally, is one sign of this intention. But more generally, the story collapses the division between the domestic and public spheres, between the private realm of sentiment and the shared space of political speech, including poetic speech. You remember that al malaika's purpose in writing the poem was, she says, to articulate her emotions, to express her sympathy for those dying in Egypt. And elsewhere in her study of metrics, al malaika characterizes her critics' censure of the new ver verse form as muhawalat wa'diha, attempts at female infanticide, which is a metaphor that she uses more than once. And wa'd, uh, which is the practice of female infanticide, was apparently practiced by uh, tribes in the Arabian Peninsula, pre-Islamic tribes in the Arabian Peninsula, and is expressly condemned by the Quran. So the invention of a shi'ar al-hur uh, epitomizes a moment of transition when the literary and political values of an older generation are challenged by a new set of techniques and commitments. And al Malaika's prosody is the offspring of these transformed historical conditions. It is a music in tune with its times, emerging out of the radio, the Twitter or Facebook of its day, and allowing her and her generation of poets to articulate their newfound solidarities. I know that a poem or a passage of a poem, may tend to realize itself first as a particular rhythm before it reaches expression in words, and that this rhythm may bring to birth the idea and the image, and I do not believe that this is an experience peculiar to myself. <clears throat> this is T.S. Eliot in his essay, The Music of Poetry. And indeed, there are many stories, like al Malaika's that relate the birth of poetry to the spirit of music. Stories that fix a poem's origin in an experience of acoustical haunting, of being possessed by a particular rhythm, as Eliot says, or of being unable to get a certain tune or phrase out of one's head. Eliot himself is echoing one of Schiller's letters to Goethe, where he writes, quote, with me the perception has at first no definite or clear object. This is formed later. A certain musical mood comes first. And this, in me, is only then followed by the poetical idea. And all of these origin stories, including al malaika has attempt a difficult feat, which is to harmonize a supposedly accidental scene of origin with the carefully orchestrated echoes of earlier stories, to harmonize the claim for spontaneity with the equally urgent claim for legitimacy. Now, the echoes we can hear in al malaika's anecdote are specific, and they are ingenious. Her discovery of the new prosody of Ash'ar al-Hur echoes a famous origin story from the 8th century, which is that of the Basran philologist Khalil ibn Ahmed's discovery of the system of classical meters, the 16 meters, that were used almost exclusively for more than a millennium. An early version of this anecdote is found in Ibn Khalil Khan's 13th century, The Obituaries of Eminent Men, quote, 
The state of Islam never produced a more innovative spirit than Al-Khalil for the discovery of sciences unknown even in their first principles to learned Arabs. And there is no clearer proof of this than the science of prosody, which he did not take from any wise man nor from any previous model, but rather invented as he walked past the coppersmiths on hearing the strokes of a hammer upon a basin. According to this anecdote, elaborated and polished by subsequent transmitters, Al-Khalil is supposed to have arrived at his classification of the 16 standard meters by listening to the varied rhythms of Basra's coppersmiths while they hammered out their wares. This type of anecdote may be derived from the exegetical genre of Asbab and Nuzul, the occasions of revelation, which detail the cause, time, and place of the Quranic revelations. And it may also be that the story of Al-Khalil and the coppersmiths is itself an echo of the classical Greek story about Pythagoras' discovery of musical intervals while listening to the tones produced by the hammers of blacksmiths, which is a story you can find in the second century manual of harmonics. Al Malaika's own anecdote of inspiration is a carefully calibrated modern instance of this same type. Her rewrite, rewrite replaces the hammers with horse hooves, the medieval souk with the modern radio. Al Malaika is careful to frame her call for a return to the science of meter as a revision as well as a return. The new science is uniquely in touch with its own historical moment. In the anecdote, this argument is made by sinking the unchanging authority of Al-Khalil with that of the radio, sign of the changing, changing times. So I'll conclude my talk with the suggestion that Al-Malaika's anecdote about expression and audition, poetry and modern technology, is helpfully thought of as a scene of tarab. Tarab is a notoriously difficult word to define or translate. It is, quote, a term po denoting poetic and musical emotion, evoking a broad spectrum of sentiments from the most private to the most violent, pleasure, enjoyment, emotional trauma, exaltation. This is according to a standard reference. More specifically, tarab is a state of intense vibration experienced by both musicians and audience linked to one another by a loop of what Jihad Racy calls ecstatic feedback. Al-Malaika's evocation of her poetic excitement in which she vacillates between active authorship and passive audition is symptomatic of this experience, as are her swings between sadness and exaltation. Let me note three further readings for proposing this. The first is that tarab is conditional on its occasion, what aficionados call jaw, or atmosphere. The ecstatic experience is dependent on the vagaries of time, place, and mood, the audience's state of receptivity, the musician's readiness to perform, which must all be in accord before tarab happens. In Al-Malaika's anecdote, the intricacy of this process suggested by the many false starts of her composition, the effort it takes to translate the sound of horses' hooves into the prosody of her poem, and it's also evident in the care with which she arranges the various parts of her story, geopolitical, generational, and personal, to fix the timeliness of her invention. The father's censure of her poem and its music, Lem Yutribni, literally, it did not give me tarab, suggests how difficult it is to be in tune with one's time and place. What gives you tarab may bore me to tears. <clears throat> and this is, I must admit, my own experience of listening to Um Kalthum, the great Egyptian Mutraba, who makes many of my friends swoon, but um, not me. <clears throat> it's a shortcoming of mine. Um, the second reason for bringing up Tarab is precisely because of its historical fit with the moment of Al Malaika's poem. The late 40s and 50s were preeminently the era of the Egyptian Mutribin, Um Kalthum, and Abd al Wahhab, whose songs were broadcast on Egyptian radio across the region, giving rise to what Virginia Danielson has called a pan-Arab tarab culture, an experience of being together in a musical mood. And if I had some time, I'd show some great clips of collective swooning. Um, they're really something to see. Elsewhere in her autobiographical fragment, El Malaika remembers listening to gramophone recordings of both singers as a young girl, and in her description of this experience, her child self is transformed into a tuning fork, motionless but vibrating. Quote, whenever I heard a record turning with a song, I would go still, nailed to the spot, even if I was in the street. So the experience of Tarab is figured as a historically specific experience of solidarity, 
of being nailed to one spot in Baghdad, it musically translated to Cairo. The final reason for advancing this reading of Tarab is that Tarab encodes an ideal of authenticity. It is an experience that is pan-Arab, but also uniquely Arab. And hence, like the Spanish duende, to which it is often compared, Tarab is famously difficult to translate. But it is the authenticity of her own innovation that al Mila'ika wants to assert, a legitimacy grounded in the classical science of meter and the contemporary moment, a time of multiple crises and obstacles to liberation. Now what is most remarkable about this use of Tarab as a mode of solidarity is that the experience itself is not one of identification, but precisely of ecstasy, of being outside oneself, ecstasis. So it's fitting that El Malaika's poem end with a figure not of achieved oneness or unity, but rather on the contrary of being ripped apart. Ya misru shu'uri mazzaqahu ma fa'al al O oh, Egypt, my feelings have been ripped apart by what death has done. And the, the, the question raised for me by this, <clears throat> in the end, I think, rather astonishing anecdote, and by al Malaika's poetry more generally, is just this. Whether the politics and the poeti poetics of nationalism can be thought of not according to a logic of identity, but rather according to a logic of ecstasy or disidentification. Might we argue that politics truly begins when a community or an individual refuses the identity assigned to her by her parents or by the state through an impossible identification with others, with Kurds and Arabs, Muslims and Christians, in the words of the Syrian I quoted at the beginning of this lecture. No one wanted to get involved, the young woman from Aleppo says in the video. Older people kept saying, you weren't around in the 80s, they're so cruel, they're going to massacre you. For us, for the youth, this was unacceptable. It strikes me that this way of understanding nationalist politics, including pan-Arabist politics, is one way of coming to terms with its utopian dimension, which is certainly a reason for its persistence, despite its repeated failures and long periods of latency. And in fact, the tropes of echo and ecstasy and disidentification are common to any number of nationalist poets. I think of the late great Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Darwish, for example, and his lyric, Ikhtaruni al the rhythm chooses me, which begins with a scene of musical haunting. Ikhtaruni al the rhythm chooses me, chokes on me. I'm the violin's reverberation, not its player. I am in the presence of memory, the echo of things that pronounce me pronouncing. And on the subject of echoes, I think two of the American, Walt Whitman, precursor to so many nationalist and modernist poets, who chants in Out of the Cradle, endlessly rocking, another poem of awakening and ecstatic listening. The sea, delaying not, hurrying not, whispered me through the night, and very plainly, before the daybreak, lisped to me the low and delicious word death, and again death, 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 hissing melodious. And I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Um, you've given a lot, us a lot to think about. The, it strikes me that you keep coming back to different types of categories of belonging. Um, there's the belonging of the family. Um, and in all of the categories that you've mentioned, I see a moment of both belonging and not belonging, of, of acceptance and not acceptance, of, of ecstasy as being as a joining and also, also a difference. And I'm wondering what the basic category of belonging in your claim that this is a parable of Arabic or pan-Arabism uh, is. 
um, precisely because there, there, at different points in your talk, there, there were points um, where I thought certain categories would mean something and then ended up meaning something else. So you talked about um, Arab nationalism um, in a certain way as if that were synonymous with pan-Arabism, whereas I would think the nation would be a dividing category, that you could have many different Arab nations uh, would share pan-Arabism, but the nation would be the thing that would be the division. And then at a certain point later, um, you talked about a kind of broad nationalism as opposed to a narrow nationalism. So I'm assuming that in the broad nationalism, there would be um, a link of pan-Arabism. So um, at another point, um, you talked about the links uh, in the metaphor of a brotherhood, which uh, in the kind of cultures that I work with would go in the direction of ethnicity. But um, it didn't strike me that that was uh, the dominant category. It struck me rather that the dominant category for your, um, in your parable um, revolved on Arabic as a language. And so I'm just wondering if if I read that correctly. Is is it's you know, is it the the shared poetic tradition that becomes in this parable the dominant way of 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 organizing both belonging and then not belonging in this modernist kind of uh, intervention which takes the tradition and changes it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I mean, it has to do with the questions of what are the constituents, what are the basic elements of any kind of nationalist ideology. And because al Malaika is a, is, she is a poet and not a political thinker per se, or not a political scientist per se, um, she's not always, uh, she's not categorical about this kind of thinking. But I think that, but I do think that, um, kind of picking up on your point, that you know, there are many kinds of nationalism. There's nationalism that's based on religion. There's nationalism that's based on ethnicity or race. There are uh, some examples that maybe in which um, uh, it's certainly there are some based on geography, um, territory, um, and language plays a more or less important role in all sorts of nationalism. So, so what are the categories of uh, Malaika's thinking about this? I think that's a great question, and it's not an easy question because I think she, um, as I say, was not a political thinker per se. She was a poet. She was a poet. Um, but what interests me in the in the anecdote, and which makes it, um, I think, worth recalling at the present moment, is precisely that her categories for thinking about nationalism are not those of ethnicity or race. Um, becoming an Arab, in the sense that she means it, I think actually doesn't have so much to do with language. Um, it, it may be appeared that way because I was concentrating on the, the, on on you know my remarks on the facts of language and the poem itself, but to me her um, her notion of what Arab nationalism means and what it would mean to commit oneself to being an Arab nationalist, which means the same thing as pan Arabism. An Arab nationalist is a pan Arabist. Um, uh, has to do with a reading of history. Um, and especially in this case, uh, the centrality of 1948. Um, so that unless you, unless you accept the centrality of 1948 for thinking about what it would mean to be an Arab, for politically speaking and intellectually speaking, um, then you probably aren't the sort of Arab nationalist that she's advocating for or, or, or feels in touch with. Um, there's advocating some kind of solidarity for. So I think it has very much to do with an interpretation of history, which means that it's an open category. Anybody can be an Arab, an Arab nationalist. You don't have to be an Arab yourself. But you have to accept, this is her argument, I think, as I'm reconstructing it through this anecdote. Um, but you do have to accept certain, um, uh, certain interpretations of, uh, of historical events, have a certain narrative about which the important historical events are. Um, so for her, it certainly means being a pan-Arab, it certainly means having to do with, um, with the centrality of 1948 and, and, a, and a kind of anti-imperialism. Um, that's the part of the, of the um, equation that maybe is, 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 well, one could argue about the degree to which that's less relevant or more relevant to us today, but it's certainly not a nationalism that's based on a closed category. Um, that, and that's what makes it interesting to me now. Yes? Well, is she still alive? And when was she born? 
No, she's, she, um, when she wrote the poem, I should have said when she was very young, she was 24 years old when she wrote the poem. Um, she died in, I believe, uh, Luat might be able to correct me, but I think 2003, 2004. Okay. Um, not so long ago. And she, um, well, that's to answer your question. Yes, I have another question. Now, is her works widespread in the Arab countries? Was she known and respected and, and taught? She's one of the great modern Arabic poets. Okay, thank you. Max. <coughs> Thanks for the talk. I have fun. Thanks. Uh, I have, I think, two questions. One, um, in some way, they both stem from a really nice phrase you used, which was acts of audition. And so this automatically put me in mind of the affective turn in, or the affect turn in study of anthropology. I don't know how far this has moved into the space of literary criticism, but it would seem that in addition to some kind of ecstatic relation, that there is also a certain convention, not only for the production of poetry, for, but for its reception. So is there an analog here in terms of cultivating a correct way of encountering the poem? And this leads to the related question, which is the means of transmission of the poem is changing. You invoked radio several times, but you showed us manuscripts and printed word. And so the question becomes, what is the fate of poetry as it's circulated? Is it circulated? Yeah. It certainly is still circulated in shared spaces in yeah. some kind of a diwan and some kind of a meeting space. But what's the difference between encountering poetry via radio set to music might create problems for some people who believe that music is a problem. So mm -hmm. is there something about the, I think it's just ultimately one question, is there something about reception in terms of correct practice of engaging poetry at play among the modernists themselves? That's a great question. Um, and it's one I haven't uh, really thought about, so I'm thinking out loud, but, you know, insofar as there are so many anecdotes um, from the period, um, not, not of hers, I mean, although I think that the anecdote is too a kind of allegory of reception, I mean, in its various phases, it's an allegory of reception, you know, um, that divides things by generation, by, by gender, and, and um, so that she's, she's declaring sides in a certain way in the way that she describes the reactions and receptions of the various people in her family um, to the poem. Um, but I, th I think the, the notion of tarab would give some way of, um, of thinking about, you know, all, all those, this is what I was going to say, Scenes in, in literature in which we hear about, and we hear about lots of them in memoirs and fiction, um, of people listening to Um Kalthum on the radio. This is a kind of trope of um, Arabic literature in the 50s and 60s, or contemporary memoirs when they remember the days of that period. Um, that, everybody, that it's always listening to the radio in collectives. You don't sit and listen to the radio by yourself. Um, you sit in a room with a family or in, you know, in Miramar, it's every Friday, a group of strangers gets around and listens to Um Kalthum on, on Fridays. Um, so I think, that, I think that's one way of talking about a, a specificity to the radio that um, is not necessarily true of poems that are circulated on social media, for instance. Not to say that they couldn't be, but that's generally speaking not the way that they're consumed. Whereas radio, in this period at least, in, in these countries, is, is, is a collective um, technology um, in a particular way of re that it's received by um, usually small kinds of collectives, I suppose. Um, on the other, and, and the, the question about, you know, the, 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 the importance of poetry in, to, in the current revolts is, is not one I've kind of come to any conclusion about. I mean, 
very famously, the, the line, the great line, Sha'ab Yurid Asqat al Nizam, is basically a rewritten line of a poem um, by the Tunisian poet Shadi. So there certainly were, there was certainly a kind of importance to um, poetry in generating slogans even for the revolt. Um, but it does seem to me that the distinctive genres of artistic practice that came out of these uh, revolts whether in Syria or Egypt or Tunisia, were not poems. They were documentary films, they were graffiti, they were forms of street art, they were rap music rather than poems. So, so there's a real difference. Um, I, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the kind of equivalent story that we would hear, that one might hear someday, that comes out of the 2011 revolts would probably not be about how I came to write a particular poem, it would be how I came to uh, draw the picture that I did or, or, um, or make the movie that I did. I'm just... Speculating, of course. But. Could I yeah. So there's a line in Nihad Sarisa's The Silence and the Roar that the narrator, who is a kind of bourgeois writer, intellectual out of favor with the regime, who argues yeah. that poetry is the language of the masses and prose is the language of the individual. Are you arguing that for Arab nationalists as well as for pre modern poets, that poetry is the language of the community? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't put it in those those bald terms, but I think, in a, in a sense, that's clearly the case. Um, uh, I mean, you know, the differences between the social groups in the pre-Islamic period. When I do think, and this is a kind of, it's a, I mean, it's, it's practically a, a saying that the, the the that the poet was a spokesman for the tribe. Um, you know, the, the tribe has a very attenuated relationship to the modern nation. But, um, but I do think, particularly this period, um, it's much more um, profitable intellectually to think about poets as being public intellectuals rather than simply um, literary figures. Um, I think more and more that's not the case, but, I, but certainly in the era of, of Adonis and Mahmoud Darwish and Nazak al-Malaika and Sayyab, um, that, that, that that was, that they were addressing mass audiences. I mean, they really were, you know, Darwish could fill up a soccer stadium, really. Um, um, so, so that was, so that was and, and that's no longer true. There's no poet in the Arab world that can do that anymore. So, so things are changing. <laughs> Imani? Um, could you talk a little bit more about um, the break that occurred with her poem? For example, what did... Well, and again, it's a very broad question, but what are some of the kind of things that she read? What, was, what were the, some of the kind of things that she was exposed to? How did this poem come into being? Well, that's what her anecdote is all about, of course. How did the poem come into being? Um, you seem unsatisfied by her account, I take it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, what makes you unsatisfied? No, no, I, I'm just curious as to what she read. I'm, I'm just right. curious as to what yeah. her you know, milieu was, because yeah. obviously you mentioned that her mother was a poet, yeah. uh, but a very different one. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it just came into being, then I'll accept that. But I, I was just a little more curious. No. <laughs> um, she, well, interestingly, Al Malaika was, um, she was a student of English literature, in fact, and she studied for a year in Princeton. Um, in the late 40s, I believe, and she got her master's degree in English literature from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> so she knew English literature very well, and she translated some poems from English, I think mostly of romantic poets, um, including Keats. Um, and some people have, I've argued with no real textual evidence, but with a certain amount of plausibility, it seems to me, that, um, that Edgar Allan Poe in particular, <clears throat> who also has a number of anecdotes about how he came to write poems like The Raven, um, which are very markedly metrical performances, uh, were important to her. And you know, if you read The Bells, for instance, um, keeping time, time, time with a sort of runic rhyme, um, the tolling, tolling, tolling of the bells, 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 bells. Um, this, sort of, this sort of rhythmical repetition certainly bears some sort of resemblance to Tol Mel, Tol Mel, Tol Mel, Tol Mel. And she knew of Poe. Um, she didn't translate any of it. She never, she, in this case, she doesn't um, remark on its influence. Um, mm -hmm. But that's one person she was, one poet she was certainly reading um, and admiring and, and thinking about. Um, she herself wrote a poom called Ajras as the Black Bells, um, 
anyway, um, she was reading a lot of Poe and Keats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Possibly. Um, I, was just, I was just wondering uh, if you could answer a bit about um, like f free verse and how uh, uh, when, you, when you read it in Arabic, for example, you mentioned you were a translator, how does it phonetically sound? How, does it, how is it different from regular metrics, you know, 16 uh, stop? Well, the thing about free verse is uh, um, uh, that it is a regular metric. Actually, it's the same meter the whole poem. So, um, you know, somebody who is familiar with uh, or used to kind of, um, you know, Amer English language verse practice or metrical practice, it will not seem a, a, an entirely radical departure, certainly not in the middle of the 20th century. But because of Arabic poetry's adherence to classical structures for a very long time, and it wasn't, and again, she was not the first person to experiment with metrical forms. Um, uh, this really was uh, an incredibly um, dramatic break with practice. So, so free verse, <clears throat> it means metrical verse, but it means ragged line lengths. That's all it means, actually. Um, but in technical term, that's all it means. But in, I think, in, in political terms, um, it ends up meaning a lot, a lot more. And Malaika has some interesting ideas, some interesting metaphors, really. Um, about you know the, the the difference between, for instance, the kind of hemistitch-based verse that we saw, the classical verse, that this has some relationship to traditional, and that's her word, um, traditional Eastern housing, so houses that have a courtyard in the middle of it, and she she compares the sejura to the open courtyard in the middle of uh, traditional Middle Eastern housing, and and that for her that this was a kind of <clears throat> cage that this was um, a, a species of confinement, actually, and that the ragged kind of line lengths was, uh, was, was, a, was a gesture of revolt. Um, anyway, everybody has their own ideas about how to translate that kind of thing, so. Stephen. Um, <clears throat> is it just a coincidence that also in 1947, uh, Camus, The Plague was published about a cholera <laughs> outbreak in an Algerian city. And it, in similar fashion, it seemed to probe humanity in the middle of facing uh, massive amounts of death mm -hmm. happening all around you. And, and beyond that, uh, what was the <clears throat> interchange between both sides of colonialism in terms of culture uh, at that time in the late you know, in the, in the 1940s, um, was, there a, was there much interchange? Was there much vibrancy? I'm, I'm more familiar with the interchange between uh, Latin American poetry and the US left in the 1980s, Nicaraguan poetry, uh, liberation theology, which was very fertile, even while there was co-optation going on as well. Yet it was uh, a, a, a pretty amazing interchange that I was involved in personally. It, was there anything like this going on at the time? And, and again, I, what inspired me to think about this was just that the fact that Camus' book came out in 1947 about a cholera outbreak. Like, yeah, that's an interesting um, uh, coincidence that I had never thought of, and maybe it's maybe it's more than a coincidence. Um, I mean, Camus was translated. The, the 25 years after the end of the Second World War were a kind of golden era for translation into Arabic. I mean, and, and a lot of um, any, any literary magazine worth its salt in Arabic was translating enormous amounts of, um, of European American, less at that point Latin American. It wasn't until Gabriel Garcia Marquez won the Nobel Prize that <clears throat> they really started translating the Latin Americans, but and that was not till the 1980s. So, but um, but uh, you could you could make the argument that that um, the wasteland was the most important poem in Arabic in the middle of the 20th century. I mean, it was that influential. Everybody from all political persuasions, communist, um, modernist, <coughs> nationalist, what have you, uh, wanted to write a kind of wasteland. And so they, they translated everything into Arabic and, um, and may, uh, arguably more then and with more um, urgency, I think, um, than, than now, although I'll 
there's lots of translation going on now too. So I don't know about that. I never thought of the Camus connection. He was translated um, and, and, and lionized in certain circles, so he was certainly known. I don't know that Malaika herself, like most Iraqi intellectuals of the period, was much more, um, for, political, for obvious political reasons, was much more in touch with um, uh, English literature. Uh, it's, it's, mo it's more in the Levant and North Africa, where, um, where French literature is, is you know, part of the, the common culture, um, part of the translated culture. So, uh, so she doesn't have many references to, to French stuff, but, um, but thanks for the, the note. I wrote my entire dissertation about this subject. Um, so yes. Uh, yeah, no, there was there was a very important avant-garde, and, and it was in Beirut. It was in Beirut, really. I think uh, I, I wouldn't call it an avant-garde, but I would call it a modernist movement. And it was in Beirut. Um, it started in the late fifties and lasted for about fifteen years. And um, and they they translated, they wrote manifestos, they published journals, they um, uh, they did all the things that modernist movements do, and um, and it was a very interesting one. And the the central figure of that movement is Adonis, who is still alive and constantly um, um, rumored to be um, a Nobel Prize winner. He's a Syrian poet, a very interesting Syrian poet, <clears throat> and he um, hasn't won yet. <laughs> Jason. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if radio makes uh, an appearance or plays a role in general in the transformation of modernist aesthetics, um, not just kind of providing uh, a context for her, an inspiration for her to write a certain poem, but yeah. is there something about uh, the qualities of the medium itself that uh, she or other poets tried to render formal analogs for in, in, the, in the texture of the poetry itself, sort of in thinking yeah. about this break with tradition, what role yeah. technological sources suggested or played, or, um, yeah. and whether that's part of the role radio has in this whole story, or if it was really just kind of where you had it. Um, she doesn't have a lot to say about, um, about technical matters um, to do with the radio. I, th I think for her it's, this, it, it's a signifier, as I suggest, of, some, of, a, of a new modern media that enables certain kinds of imagined political communities, new ones, um, like, like the Pan-Arab one. Um, but there are other poems. <clears throat> um, I wish I knew more of them, but, but one, of the, one of the more interesting ones from a, a few years later, um, there's a poem by Mahmoud Darwish, for instance, called Risala Min al Manfa, a letter from exile, which um, the scene of the poem, which is a lyric poem, um, after 1948, there was obviously um, a massive um, refugee population of Palestinians living outside of Palestine, and there was a radio program set up by the, by the State of Israel, actually, um, which transmitted letters um, back and forth between family members living inside of Israel or inside of inside of Israel at the time or living outside of Israel and this was a weekly program in which they talked back and forth basically and the poem itself um, is an interesting one because it the speaker is imagining himself outside of Palestine speaking into a microphone um, speaking to his family basically and he keeps on basically telling them I'm all right he uses all these epistolary convention. So epistolary is opposed to the media that he's using now, which is the radio. And, and the poem is kind of about him discovering that all of these epistolary conventions telling his family that he's fine uh, are obviously untrue and um, not, uh, they're not adequate to the historical moment, to his own crisis. So that there needs to be some way of doing poetry which is not um, written and epistolary, but which is maybe maybe oral and disseminated in different kinds of ways, which is one way of thinking about what Darwish himself was trying to do, especially in his, in his early poetry. So there are poems in which the figure of the radio is, is more um, clearly um, named and, and thought about, and, but which is also tied to particular kinds of historical occasions, in this case, you know, a particular radio program that existed in Israel and Palestine at the time. So, um, so there, are, there are some interesting examples. Yeah. <clears throat>
Michelle has one, one more. One more. Uh, if, if, if you don't mind, my following, following up. Um, in the kind of literature that I work on, plague serves as a metaphor for the for civil war, and particularly kind of the dissolution of the body politic that that takes it from a particular local context and universalizes it. Do you think that that's also what's going on with the cholera metaphor here? Uh, I think not, actually. I mean, I think that it's much more particularized because I think it has to do with a kind of um, condemnation of certain kind of colonial policies that allow this, historically speaking, allow this particular um, pl plague, cholera, to take place. So it's not about connecting the sufferings of these victims to humanity in general. It's about saying, I'm empathizing with you on the basis of Arab nationalism, because we're both suffering the same kind of colonial condition in this case. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the blame for this cholera, I think she's pretty clear, um, has to do with you know, historical imperialism, the British armies. So. Thank you.